Welcome to Radio Free Sunroot. You're listening to the interview podcast, Voices for Nature and Peace, where we discuss issues of ecology, empire, justice, and consciousness. We feature a variety of guests who are aware of the challenges of our time and who are working to address them. Here's your host, Calibri Ter Sonnenblum. Episode 52 Everything Has to Change Featuring Brenna Bell Brenna Bell is a forest activist and is the policy coordinator and staff attorney at BARC, a grassroots environmental organization based in Portland, Oregon. BARC's mission is to transform Mount Hood National Forest into a place where natural processes prevail, where wildlife thrives, and where local communities have a social, cultural, and economic investment in its restoration and preservation. Brenna brings to her work a lifetime of passion for the Pacific Northwest, 20 years of organizing experience, and an extensive background in environmental law and education. Her involvement with Cascadia Forest Alliance and the campaign to save Eagle Creek led her to Lewis and Clark Law School, where she graduated cum laude. Brenna has worked with numerous nonprofits and is co-founder of Tryon Life Community Farm, a community sustainability education center. She also lives and is raising her two children and many goats in Cedar Moon, the intentional community at TLC Farm. Brenna and I have known each other since the early 2000s when we met in Portland's forest defense community. I've been an admirer of her work and of Bark's efforts the whole time, so it was a real pleasure to talk to her on January 14th, 2021. We discussed her calling to legal work, her early years of forest activism, Bark's mission, the history of public land starting with its theft from Native Americans, how public land is managed for resource extraction rather than preserved or restored for ecology, how national forests are required to meet annual timber targets, state co-management of federal lands, the damage to environmental protections during the Trump years, including the Sue and Settle method, fire ecology, how climate change extends the fire season, how fire science is ignored by the timber industry and the Forest Service, how the media covers fire, climate change and the role of forests in sequestering carbon, the incoming Biden administration, climate justice, the mythology around the concept of quote unpeopled wilderness, the importance of looking to indigenous leadership for conservation and restoration, being inspired by today's youth, and the need for generational work. If you like this episode, please share it on social media. If you're watching it on YouTube, please like, comment, and subscribe. To support my work financially, you can make a one-time donation at paypal.me slash colibri, or become a patron at patreon.com slash colibri. That's K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. Patreon subscribers get early access to podcast episodes and exclusive content. The music in this intro is by Dr. Dreamchip of Portland, Oregon. See show notes for links to follow their work. And now, here's my conversation with forest defense activist and friend, Brenna Bell. Do you think you could give us a little background about how, well, because you're an environmental lawyer, so maybe you could tell us a little bit about how you chose that and what that path's been about for you. Sure. Well, I I like to always think of myself as an activist first and and a lawyer second or a forest activist that needed a better tool set. Um, And that's really why I went to law school. I got involved in forest activism I pretty much the week after I graduated from college, Lewis and Clark, it was right um, after the salvage writer had passed in 1995, and then there were the Warner Creek blockades and in 1996, and they kind of became very rapidly stuff of legend to me, and I was super inspired to get out to the forest and do what I could to protect it um, from really what the, was the lawless logging. And I was young and excited and had no idea about anything, but I knew I liked trees. I grew up in the rural Northwest and in the forest, Mount Baker, Snoqualmie National Forest was, you know, one of my like favorite backyard haunts. So I started getting involved with Cascadia Forest Alliance and their 
um, campaign to stop the eagle timber sale on Mount Hood National Forest. That would have been in 1997. And um, I was excited about all aspects of it except tree sitting because I'm I'm pretty afraid of heights. I did <laughs> eventually get up into the tree. I spent a wonderful several days doing a solo sit up in sunset. But um, getting up and getting down was terrifying for me. Right. So right. I thought I was better on the ground. And, and I had a skill set that was just better um, better suited to talking and organizing. And so I did all that while I was in that. I just graduated from college, working at a coffee shop, not sure what I'm doing time of life. Uh-huh. And as I continued that work, I was like, wow, this is my life's calling, but, you know, I have very little credibility just as a nice girl who likes trees. <laughs> and and I, I remember being at a public meeting with the Forest Service and thinking if I could stand up with, like, the credentials of the system behind me and speak more truth to power, they would have to listen. Right. And right. and maybe I was right. I mean, I'm not entirely sure, looking back on it. Uh-huh. it you know, I've seen plenty of people without those credentials do amazing work. Um, but that was in my mind. And in high school and college, I was a debater um, and, 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 and fairly, fairly adept at it. And so law school made sense to me. And Portland happened to have one of the best environmental law schools in the country. So... I went to law school for the trees. You know, I really just wanted to arm myself more with information and, and credibility so that I could fight, um, fight with better tools against the industrial system that kept just taking trees for profit. So that's why I went to law school. And, and then to a large part, I've done that. Um, I was determined to never lose my connection with activists and people who are actually doing the road blockades and sitting in the trees. And so I've, I've stayed connected to those communities and still really orient myself towards that type of activism. I'm honestly seldom in court anymore. Um, I did just have a fantastic victory. We can talk about in a moment if you'd like. Um, but for the most part right now, I'm doing more organizing policy work and education because that's still what I'm most excited about is just talking to people about forests and and, and how we can use the systems that exist to protect them better, and then how we can change the systems so we don't have to fight so hard. Right, right. Yeah, it's interesting. We um, both uh, were drawn into these issues in part by the Cascadia Forest Alliance, because mm-hmm. I, I moved to Portland in 2001, and I'd lived in the Midwest and the East Coast before that and really didn't know about forests at all. But I happened to move on to a, into a house on Clinton Street right across the street from CFA. And so yeah. I just got pulled into it. And I was already doing indie media work at that time. And the Eagle Creek uh, campaign was just ending at the time that I moved. And then the solo campaign on Mount Hood was the one that I ended up being involved in. Uh, a lot. And that's where I ended up going in a, in a tree set for the first time. And what an amazing experience to be up there. But yeah, the climbing, the up and down part is really... <laughs> <scary>. <laughs> it's really high up there. Yeah, yeah, by the time Solo came around, I had left Portland. My first job out of law school was with the Klamath Siskiyou Wildland Center oh, okay. in Southern Oregon. And I was their staff attorney. So I was doing the, the same kind of work but in Southern Oregon and Northern California forests. I really wanted to work in Portland and stay on the Mount Hood, but the only um, group that was more established at that time was BART, and they weren't very established, so they just didn't have the capacity to bring on a lawyer, even a, like a young, scrappy lawyer who didn't want much money. Um, so I, you know, I, I stayed connected to CFA as I could from, from the South, but I didn't, didn't really get into solo. Right. Did you end up getting involved with the Biscuit campaign? Well, you know, I was in Southern Oregon during the Biscuit fires. So that was my second season down there. And it was already hard to be in Southern Oregon because I, I, you know, I'm such a child of the the Northwest. I'm like way more slug than lizard. Um, (laughs) But it was fascinating. It was my first major fire season ever. And it was huge fire season, 2002. Um, so the fires happened and then I spent another year in Southern Oregon. We were organizing against, a um, a volume replacement sale, the, the peak sale up in the Cascades, but the salvage logging for Biscuit 
got proposed in 2003, and that was just in 2004, and that was the time I was transitioning back to move to Portland, um, mostly to move to the land that we're on now to save the farm from becoming a housing development. So I missed like the brunt of the fight against the biscuit salvage since I was back up here. Right, right. And the um, so, so Bark, I just want to um, talk about Bark real quickly, is, is an organization based in Portland, which focuses on Mount Hood, the Mount Hood area. Mm-hmm. Right. And just the Mount Hood National Forest or no, just any 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 of the any of the uh, issues that are going on in, the, in that general area. Right. Or. Well, <laughs> you know, I've, I've been boundary pushing because they, you know, it's the. The, the political lines are fairly arbitrary, uh-huh. right? Ecosystems do not um, follow those lines. And Bark started just focused on Mount Hood National Forest. It's also got um, BLM-managed lands, right. especially in the Clackamas River area. Mm-hmm. So then we said, you know, Mount Hood National Forest and surrounding public lands. But, you know, honestly, we're kind of expanding to recognize that there are many forces at work that affect Um, the forest. So those are both like the surrounding management of the area, like county lands or state managed lands. And those are also the larger policy issues in terms of federal policy issues. And more and more state politics are affecting federal lands because they're they're doing more uh, co-management agreements between the state and the federal government. So while our main focus has always been Mount Hood, we're definitely recognizing that it doesn't exist in a vacuum. Right, right. And looking not. at the both the land and the policies that impact what happens on Mount Hood right. National Forest. Right. Okay, maybe this would be a good place to talk a little bit about um, public land and how it's managed by some of these different agencies. Because I think that a lot of people, I mean, I know that when I first moved to the, to the Pacific Northwest, I had... I had some some different impressions that I then found out weren't true because I was like, oh, national forests, that must just be a protected area like a national park. And then I found out, oh, it's not, you know, the the the, the forestry service is actually under the Department of Agriculture because right. the, it's viewed as a crop to be managed. So maybe you could talk a little bit about some of these agencies like, you know, in the Bureau of Land Management, et cetera, and how it's it's not focused about how the focus is not necessarily on ecology but on uh, profit. Sure. Well, I think I, if I'm talking about the history of land, I want to take it even a little step back farther. Please. One of the things I've started doing a few years ago is really recognizing, first of all, that all national forests are on stolen land. Right. Right. Like the reason, because there's a question, like why does the federal government manage, you know, 50% of Oregon, um, like I think it's like 70% of Nevada. I mean, there's like huge swaths of land in the West that are managed by the federal government, either the Bureau of Land Management and Department of Interior or the Forest Service and Department of Agriculture, like you said. And the reason that is is because the federal government were, you know, the shock troops of colonization. And, you know, in in Oregon is the history I know best. They came in the 1850s and just invalidated native title to the land Um, had the Oregon Donation Land Claims Act of 1850, where the federal government said, you know, all native title is extinguished. The indigenous people were pushed out of all of the most productive land into reservations, which, um, you know, there's a a long and sordid history about. Many of those reservations then got shrunk to make more national forests. Um, But with Mount Hood, the you know, the U.S. government took all that land and then tried to give it away to, quote, unquote, bona fide white settlers. And there was this massive land giveaway. And, of course, the settlers wanted the fertile lands, the lands in the valleys, the lands that they could farm, where, you know, most of the productive native villages had been. They didn't so much want the land that was up in the forest, and it was hard to access, and it was rocky, um, up on the mountains. So what ended up after this, like, huge colonial land grab and giveaway was the federal government was left holding all of this land that they were trying to give away through the general land office, you know, to encourage white settlement, but just ended up not doing it um, because people didn't want it. And so that was the origin of the national forests as we know them 
in the Pacific Northwest. Um, so they're very, very much the relics of colonial land theft. And I'm sure every state, if you go into it, you can kind of trace some kind of that pattern happening. And so the General Land Office held all this land. And in 1905, the U.S. Forest Service was created. And, and at first, they actually were called forest reserves because it was the result of that kind of white man conservation movement with like the John Muirs and Gifford Pinchot's of the 1890s who really talked about conserving the wilderness that had no people in it, right. which was, of course, false and another yeah. colonial attitude, um, but for like scenic enjoyment and recreation and hunting, right? So there's this whole big push to do that. So at first they were considered forest reserves, but then that shifted um, as, you know, both the industry and the politicians of the day thought, wait, there is money to be made from these. And so when the Forest Service was created in 1905, it was specifically created for the products of the forest, which were considered the timber and um, the water, but mostly the water for irrigation, for irrigating farms. Mm, of course. And so the, the basic DNA of the Forest Service always came from what can these produce for, you know, the, the colonial com- communities that were just growing in the West then. And and even even with that, the the forests weren't really heavily logged until after World War II, when there was this huge building boom, um, and also all these men who come back from the war who needed employment and wanted housing, and so they were both employed to log, and then all of those logs spurred that that big World War II housing boom and the industrial firefighting that we still have where there's this, like, really militarized approach to putting out fires. So the the Forest Service itself always has been looked at for that, like you said, that egg product. Um, and people want that to change. Some people think that it should go to the Department of the Interior, that that would be a, a better place for it, where all the other land management agencies are. And I, I think, you know, something major has to shift in the agency because – Honestly, most of those trees are gone. They log, you can only log old growth once, right. and, and most of them have been logged. So the national forests cannot continue to provide as much volume, timber volume, as they used to. And they shouldn't, because it's also the, like, kind of the last best place for all the wildlife habitat and biodiversity that you know, still, despite everything, is still thriving in the national forests. Right, right. Because it's something like, what, 5% of the old growth is left at this point? Yeah, about. Right. It's very small. Right. And and some of that's still on the chopping block. That's just unbelievable to me. I think that would be to most people. It is. There's there's a, a push right now for the incoming Biden administration to sign an executive order that would effectively halt logging of mature and old growth forests. And the place where that would matter the most is the Tongass National Forest up in southeast Alaska right. because it still has some of the most, most of the old growth is in the Tongass. Um, but that's a hope that the Biden administration will just say, all right, we're just going to put that all on hold while we come up with a better plan because logging the last of the old growth is not a good plan. Right, right. So um, when we were when we were talking earlier about the Cascadia Forest Alliance and, and some of these campaigns, we were talking about opposition to particular timber sales that mm-hmm. were happening within the Mount Hood National Forest. And I think that the timber sale program is also something that a lot of people are unfamiliar with and don't understand how it's really a giveaway to the industry. So maybe you could explain just the, kind of the basics to us of how that works. Sure. Um I think a main thing to know, which is you know sometimes hidden in there, is each national forest is given specific timber targets that it is supposed to meet every year. And its budget is tied to meeting those targets. The performance of its um, line officers, like the district rangers and the forest supervisors, is tied to meeting those targets. So basically coming down from Washington, D.C., they say, you must produce, say, 30 million board feet of timber this year. And then the the Forest Service has to start planning sales to meet those targets. And um, for a long time, that's just what it did. You know, the Forest Service just 
was always in the middle midst of planning sales. And back when, when you and I both started, there were smallish sales, maybe a couple of hundred to a couple of thousand acres, and targeting larger trees. Um, and going through an analysis process uh, mandated by the National Environmental Policy Act that says that the Forest Service has to study the environmental impacts of those sales and involve the public in planning them, give a chance for the public to comment, and going through fairly in-depth environmental analyses. Um, but they were still just putting out sale after sale. And, you know, when we say that, it's, it's just to describe it to people who aren't familiar with it, it's basically just a way of chunking up the forest and creating specific contracts um, that then it has a bidding process to timber companies and they bid for the right to come and log the sale and take the product out. So the forests are still, you know, managed by the government, supposedly owned by the people, but private companies will pay to have the the privilege of coming and logging them. And given that the environmental analysis process takes a long time and a lot of staff, and given that uh, any kind of restoration that's needed after the logging happens is also paid for by the Forest Service, um, any economic analysis of those timber sales shows that they lose money to the federal government. Because while the timber company might be paying a fair price for the logs, they're not paying for the entire kind of um, just everything else that's included in planning the sale and cleaning up after it. So it's a way that private industries can profit from public resources and are basically subsidized by the federal government to do so to keep making sure that those timber targets are met. So really, it's a big corporate giveaway. Right. <laughs> Just right. In, in simple is, um, you know, and, and the, the, the things that lose are, you know, the ecosystems, the people, recreationalists, people who have different values for the forest than timber production um, because of that. Right. I mean, it all kind of comes from a more maybe one could say old-fashioned attitude where it's like, oh, these are the, quote, resources of the nation for the nation to dispose of however they would like, you know? And right. in that way, it's kind of uh, nationalistic, I guess one could say, too. Mm -hmm. and, and, and very, and very corporate-focused, because if you look at the Forest Service's budget that it gets, you know, designated every year, the, the majority of it still aside from everything that goes to futilely fighting fires, goes towards what they call vegetation management. Even right. though it's been shown that, like, outdoor recreation, the actual economic value of it is far exceeds the economic value of timber management. Because the only people making money from that are the timber companies. Right. And, people and, and the mills, like, people directly involved in it. Whereas there's a massive service industry that supports the recreation economy. Um, that it's just so much more engaged. And so just purely from an economic lens, which is not how I like to look at the forests, but if you looked at it purely economically, the, the government should be investing in its recreation programs, but it's just not. Right, right. So basically what you're saying, it doesn't even make sense economically. No, it doesn't even make sense economically. It's a corporate giveaway right. that does not make economic sense. Right. Right. And we see this repeated other places, too, obviously, with the Bureau of Land Management as well. And uh, yep. uh, now you mentioned the, the states and um, you said uh, co-management with the states. And I, I, have, I don't know so much about that. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, that's that's something that's really growing. There's a new um, without getting too policy geeky. There's a new approach that's called the Good Neighbor Authority. Because there's so much state land that's adjacent to federal forest lands in the West. And so it allows the states to do um, management projects on federal lands. And it's, it, I would say that the, the jury is still out on whether or not this is a good idea. Um, it also is allowing uh, adjacent tribes to do pan management on federal lands, many of which were there, you know, homelands and ceded lands. And, and that's exciting. I think that's, a, that's an exciting shift, and that's very new. Um, but it, it shifts 
the focus away from just the federal government in some way because the agency has been chronically underfunded and understaffed for the past about 20 years and just doesn't have the ability to do some basic land management functions. And so if the state and the tribes, if the neighbors, we should say, actually can do projects that are beneficial, um, there, there is a lot of restoration that needs to be done in the national forest. You know, not not the stuff that the timber industry is talking about. They would have you think that they could go in and log log their way to forest fires and call it restoration, which is, you know, simply untrue. But there's just been a lot of, like, degraded roads. There's this vast network of roads in the national forest that is just falling to pieces. And if other contractors could come in and other agencies, the state agencies or the tribal agencies, could manage those contracts, that could be a good thing. Um, however, if it's that same kind of profit-driven timber giveaway um, with like a vague veneer of restoration, then that's just another another bad player. So right. we're still we're still seeing. I mean, it's really just like what are the values driving the management? So that matters more kind of than who who is the body doing it. Right, right. And do you think that there's more opportunity? With, with these kinds of programs for people at the local level to be able to impact the policy than when it's just federal decision-making? Yeah, I think that there's, there's opportunities no matter who it is because the Forest Service is a really, um, like, a distributed kind of organization where people are making decisions at the local level. Like, the district ranger is making decisions for that district. Okay. Um, and they're, you know, they, they have, like I said, they have their targets, they have their budget. Those are all given by the federal government, but there's a lot of leeway in individual decision-making, a lot of local leeway in individual decision-making, even in the Forest Service. So, which is why groups like BARC are effective, right? Because we, we work on that really local level. Uh-huh. And, um, oh, I should just say for people with a the chronology, they're like, wait, but Brenna, you said you didn't get to work with BARC. <laughs> <laughs> I did. Ten years ago, Bark finally had the capacity to hire me as a, a staff attorney. So that's where I've been for the last ten years. Um, and really focused on both trying to change individual sales to make them better or stop them completely when they're really wrong um, and change the overall trajectory of the agency. However, given those pressures from above, that can be hard. So you know, it, it is challenging. I think that at every level, there are, are pressure points and ways for people who want to be involved to get involved. Right. Um, but it, it can be it, it can be hard when, like, the last four years have been really hard oh, I'm in sure. terms of the, the federal policy direction. And, you know, they've done a lot of damage in terms of federal policy that we're going to see the trickle down. And even though I know a lot of people are hoping this new administration will try and stem that tide... The Trump administration was super successful in rolling back regulations and changing things. Um, and I don't know how that's all going to play out. Right. I, I feel like the environmental crimes of the Trump administration were underreported mm-hmm. while it was going on. Because yeah. a lot of them were sneaky. They were sneaky. They were like, it's all this regulatory rollback that people you know, don't really pay attention to. Yeah, people don't understand. I think that like the, there was the rollback on the NEPA stuff, you know, right. and a lot of people have no idea what an important tool NEPA was and has been, mm-hmm. you know, this yeah. whole time. So they didn't understand the significance of that. Yeah, and then there was also this kind of sue and settle where the where the industries would sue the federal government over regulations that they didn't like, and then the Trump's Department of Justice would just be like, all right. You're right. It, they, they wouldn't fight it. They're like, yeah, that's a bad regulation. We'll just settle with you to uh, undermine it. And that, like, just yesterday, a new critical habitat um, ruling for the northern spotted owl came out, a new rule that is directly the result of this kind of litigation by the timber industry. They said the critical, the, the spotted owl has too much critical habitat. Oh, my gosh. Even though it's still in decline. It's still declining three to five percent per year it's like on this crash course towards extinction but the industry still thinks they were too protected and the fish and wildlife service you know was directed by the department of justice they're like okay get rid of three million acres of critical habitat oh my god 
I hadn't heard so, about that. Yeah, yeah, I hadn't heard about that end of it. Hot off the presses. It just came out. So wow. that that kind of thing, you know, it, the, they are very well organized. I will have to say industry sometimes is way more organized than us activists because they're just really funded. And they have the ability to immediately take advantage of these moments, like the past four years, to push forward an agenda that they've had for a long time which is deregulate and, you know, really um, make it more and more so that public resources are used for private profit. Right. So, which is one of the frustrating things about the work that we do. Like, we try and stop just, like, this one timber sale, right? Spend all this time on this one place-based timber sale. But the, the bigger systems that are moving around us are really what's what's driving everything. So... You know, for that one particular place, we may have saved it, but we haven't changed much of the system. So I think Bark's trying to do more and more work of thinking, like, how do we leverage our place-based knowledge towards more systemic change Mm -hmm. so we're not always fighting, like, at the very end of a project? Right, right. I think that there's other activists in, in, in other areas who also have been seeing that uh, over the oh, recently too. I think that, you know, the George Floyd protests this year really mm-hmm. uh, demonstrated to a lot of people that there were systemic issues, you know, with that one, with, with, with police, for example, you know? Right. right. Yeah, in a way that wasn't seen before. So the fire keeps coming up as, as a oh, topic yeah. here. So this, this is such an interesting topic, of course, because on one hand, there's so many ecosystems in the West and in the Pacific Northwest that are either fire tolerant or actually fire dependent. But then mm-hmm. on the other hand, we have uh, a climate situation which is exacerbating things or which is, which is changing that dynamic so that it's not so easy to just say, Oh, fire is not a not not a bad thing, you know, or that it's right. that it's natural because what's I mean, maybe I'm putting this wrong, uh, but you know that what's quote natural is changing or something. Yeah, it's it's complicated, and this year um, this year was a, was a doozy here in Oregon in terms of the fires, and and like I said, I, I learned about fire, you know, <laughs> my baptism by fire was the biscuit fire, and um, that fire season, which was you know, one of the biggest and worst in Oregon's history till now. Um, and the Labor Day fires here just were, were an astonishing, astonishing fires. Um, and also not unprecedented. Like mm-hmm. the, what happened, what, what I really like, because I talk a lot about fire and do a lot about fire education. Um, and I like to help people think through uh, different fire regimes and, you know, fire return intervals and the different types of fire. And the fires that happened um, this year in Oregon, they were these extreme weather-driven events. And, and I like to help people think about those fires like they think about tornadoes mm-hmm. okay. or hurricanes. Okay. Right? It's an extreme weather event that no amount of pushback is going to change. Right? I have a friend who lives in New Orleans who called me during the fires just to check in, which was wise. I mean, it was crazy here. It was, you know, could barely breathe. We almost had to evacuate our farm. <laughs> you wow. know, it was really, it was not great. So she was calling to check in, kind of like I call her during hurricanes. Uh-huh. <laughs> and, and we were talking about it. And I was like, yeah, I wish people would, would think about it the same way. Because you in New Orleans, you're not out there with like leaf blowers trying to blow back the hurricane. Uh-huh. Right? You just are hunkering down because you are prepared. You have a plan. You know what to do because this is a weather event that happens. And I think we need to shift our thinking and remember that some fires we can put out. Whether or not we should is debatable um, because you know, a century of fire suppression has caused a lot of problems. But some fires we can because, you know, they're not raging weather events. You know, most fires, 95% of fires are less than an acre. Okay. You know, mm-hmm. they're small, they happen, they usually get put out right away. Mm-hmm. Um, but if they were let burn, it might be beneficial because, you know, like you said, fire does have a beneficial impact. But then when you get these fires that are like the perfect storm of extreme weather, and for us, that's usually, in, in, in Western Oregon, it's usually because of like these hot east winds. Mm-hmm. Um, there's 
absolutely nothing that can be done to put it out. Just nothing. It, it, it is driven by weather. It will change because of the weather. And the only thing we can do is prepare. Right. And so we're really, really trying to shift everyone's perspective rather than to spending literally billions of dollars trying to put out fires that cannot be put out to how do we prepare? We could give everyone in the wildland urban interface a metal roof. Right. Probably right. cost $2 billion, but it would only be one, one expenditure, right, rather than an annual expenditure. We could put more money into proactive planning in terms of zoning, like who can build where. And if you build in this zone, what do you have to do to make your house more, you know, fire resilient? Because the, the catastrophe was not the fires. You know, even these really big hot ones, um, the forests know how to grow back from those. But the catastrophe right. is houses burning down. I mean, we had, we've lost whole communities, you know, like the town of Gates, Oregon, and Mill City, and Brighton Bush. And then in southern Oregon, we had a ur- really bad urban fire at the same time where most of Talent and Phoenix burned down. Oh, it's just terrible. That had nothing to do I, yeah. with trees. I, I drove by that uh, uh, in the fall this year, and it was astounding oh, yeah. just seeing what oh, had yeah. happened to Talent. Yeah. And, like, that's not because of trees. Logging's not going to stop those fires. <laughs> no, no. But you did ask about climate change, and I think it's a, it's a good question, and a lot of people are wondering, like, how, how does the changing climate affect fire behavior? And the main thing it's doing is it's extending our fire season. Mm-hmm. Like, that's what it's doing because, you know, we're, we're not in the drought that you are in New Mexico, but, you know, Oregon has been in a drought situation for years. Mm-hmm. where every summer we're just, you know, we're drying out just a little bit more. And then the next summer, just a little bit more. And so our fire season is extending because the main driver of fire is how wet your wood is, the fuel aridity. Um, you know, anyone who's built a fire knows that. Right, <laughs> it's, right, like, <laughs> <yeah. laughs> it's really like, how wet's your wood? And as we have longer and longer um droughts, our wood is just drier for a longer period. But it's not really affecting the severity of the fires. Okay. It's, it's just how, 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 how likely is it to happen? Okay. Okay. So high severity fire is, it's, it's natural. I mean, we don't, we don't necessarily like them. I haven't actually been out to the Clackamas yet, which is uh-huh. one of my favorite places in the world, because mm-hmm. the roads are closed. The 224 has been closed since September. Oh, wow, really? Um, and I haven't been there yet, but I've seen pictures, and I've cried, and I love fire. Like, I really talk about how uh-huh. great fire is for natural ecosystems. But, like, the Riverside Trail with, like, this, like the most lush, beautiful old growth you can imagine is just, like, ashen. Wow. The whole 224 is just completely burned, and now they log to the sides of the roads um, mm-hmm. because of hazard tree removal. So it's, com- it's a completely different landscape. Wow. And still, it is, it's in the realm of natural variability, okay. as they say. Okay. Yeah, I guess that that part, that's something that that's, um, I've been trying to get my mind around and trying to figure out is, is because you've heard the, there, you do hear these claims that fires mm-hmm. are worse now than they were yeah. before. But you would, what you're saying is that it's not necessarily that they're worse and more intense, but that they're starting, maybe they're starting earlier and going later than they would have in the past. That's exactly right. And the fuel is drier uh-huh. than it was in the past. So right. it's more arid. They're like more likely to happen. But the, the actual, you know, I kind of geek out on all the science around this, but the, and people have really mapped it. Fire severity is not increasing. Okay. Like there's still, you know, most fires still burn in, in pretty cool mosaics uh-huh. um, where there's highest fi- severity and mid and low. And, and each type of severity has its own benefit. You know, there, there can be this narrative that good fire is low severity fire, bad fire, you know, burns everything. Um, but every forest just has a different fire history, and, and some forests need high severity fires to regenerate. That's their natural cycle. The okay. wet forests on the west side of the Cascades, that is their natural cycle. Okay. Because they don't burn unless it's an extreme weather event. Right, right. It would have to be. You know? So that's <laughs> the only way they burn is if they burn extremely. And so okay. if people come and say, oh, we'll just spin these forests and then they'll burn better. It's like that's actually shifting them outside of their natural cycle. Uh-huh. That might work on the east side. 
so it's really dependent. And, you know, the timber industry is loves now to position itself as the hero of fire. They're like, we'll come log the trees so they won't burn. Um, but the science does not support that. And in fact, that's the, the lawsuit that we won most recently in Bark was specifically challenging a timber sale on the east side of Mount Hood, where they were going into mature and old growth forests. Some were as old as like 350 year old stands. Oh, goodness. And logging and saying that they were doing it for restoration for and to fire risk reduction. <laughs> and over 12,000 acres. It was a huge, huge project. And, you know, I argued that the science is just counter to that. And they were like, no, it's not. <laughs> that was their only answer. Like, no, it's not. And we were like, yeah, it actually is. Here's all this science. They're like, that's not what it says. <laughs> it was, I mean, they really backed themselves into a corner because when we finally were up at, at the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals and had judges who actually read all of the, the record, all of the comments, all of the science, you know, they're like, wait a second, this is exactly what it says. And, and the, the Forest Service's poor attorney just had, had nothing to say. They're like, but well, doesn't it exactly say this? And he's like, mm, mm, no, <laughs> I guess it does. <laughs> and so we got this great opinion where the court said, if there is contrary science, you have to look at it. Uh-huh. And here it says that logging these forests might make the fires more severe, right? By opening up the canopy, drying out the wood, increasing wind speed, putting all this kindling on the ground, all these things that happen when you log, actually could lead to worse fires. And um, so that's great to have in the books for everyone else who's working on these issues of, you know, trying to push back against logging to, you know, reduce fire risk. Right, right. Because there's been plenty of study the the last few years. That is some of the things I have read and looked into where they've gone into, they've, they've, they've been studying different areas and being like, okay, here's an area where there was a fire and they logged. Here's an area where there was a fire and they didn't log. And they've been able to, to, to um, compare that, you know, as well, you know, so the science, I mean, it does seem like the science really is there and that industry is just going to say, the timber industry is just going to say whatever it needs to say in order to get what it wants, basically. Yes, exactly. That's what they do. They don't fact check themselves like we do. Right. I mean, every now and then I wish I wasn't as tethered to the truth as the industry is because they can just say whatever. They just make shit up all the time. Right. And um, no one's fact checking them, but we're we're so committed to like following the science and getting it right you know it's right. it almost it's like how villains you know in superhero movies the uh-huh. villains aren't tied by a code of ethics right they can just do whatever but the superhero is always like oh but i have to be good right. it means you have a lot less tools to work with yeah 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 no i, I i'm a comic book <laughs> fan so i'm following you there yeah definitely <laughs> I know. I'm like, why don't we be the good guys? I mean, we are the good guys, but right. it just means we have to be more committed to the truth. And we just can't say whatever we want to say and just repeat it and repeat it and repeat it until right. people believe it, Right. which is what the industry has done. And, you know, when, there was all that pushback against logging. And so now the timber industry doesn't log. They just restore the forest. Oh, right. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what the Forest Service does, too. They don't actually, you know, Calibri, they do not plan timber sales anymore. No. They only plan integrated restoration projects. Oh, okay. All right. I see. <laughs> Seriously. That's what wow. they're all called. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Or fuels reduction projects. Right. 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 So the, I think, I feel like the, the media has kind of a role in this too, and that the it seems like the way that media covers fire uh, is really leaves a lot to be desired. Yeah. It's like they're perfect ca- catastrophic um, event, you know, how the news loves catastrophes. Fire presents a fantastic catastrophe. You know, there are, um, and pardon me if you can hear my rooster in the background. Oh, it's, I think it's charming. Yeah. <laughs> I'm outside, like getting this little bit of sun because we've had so, such little bit of it. Right. Um, yeah, I've read, I've read studies on the way the media covers fire and you can just like look at the words that they use and, you know, it's the catastrophes and it's like the gulfs and flame and devastate and destroy the forest. They're incinerating things. Um, yeah. And of course people think that the entire forest is, is, you know, ashes, is gone, is devastated because that's what they're being told. 
Right, right. Well, and then, of course, there's this history of, of fire suppression, which is connected to that in, in terms of like, well, we all grew up with Smokey the Bear, you know? Right. You know? Yes. So we were yeah, all given... only you can, can prevent forest fires. Right, right. And so we were all... You know? And so there was always this idea of like, oh, forest fires must be bad because Smokey says we're supposed to be preventing them. Yeah, not only that, but we can prevent them, you know? Right. But Smokey doesn't go out and say only you can prevent hurricanes. <laughs> right? right no one and, and and you know this is nuanced because obviously we want to be smart around fire like right we don't want to just leave our campfires burning especially i mean that's one of the ways that the riverside fire in the clackamas burned down was they, they had a fire ban it was extreme fire weather and someone left their campfire unattended oh, gee. like that was mm-hmm. stupid right however it probably could have that fire could have been lit by any number of things um and and so I want us to take personal responsibility without having this false sense that we can actually control or prevent all fires. Right. Okay. Yeah. No. That that is that that's a good distinction. And of course, I think a lot of what I, I've spent a lot of a time in the last few years uh, working in Northern California on some of the cannabis farms there. So of course, I've been around the the fires and a lot of what you hear down there is about creating defensible space around mm-hmm. uh, structures. You know, and some people think that that's really that, that that's like the biggest thing that can happen really is just to try to keep the fire away from the, from the buildings. Yeah. I mean that we maybe can do not, of course, all, also not always, but we actually can make more resilient communities. I want, I want Smokey to be saying that right. <laughs> only you can make fire resilient communities. Right. Right. So let's talk a little bit more about climate change though. And, and the, the role of forests in that, of uh, or and maybe I guess the the role of of cutting down forests in that however you'd like to to say it but it's, yeah okay this that this is actually something I'm probably most excited about in oh, my great. work now is over the past many years people have been drawing more and more connections between the role of forests um, to sequester and store carbon and also the role of logging to prematurely release that carbon. And so we're in a condition, you know, I'm, I'm sure this is similar everywhere where there's forest, but since I work in Oregon, it's what I know most, where the timber products industry is one of Oregon's biggest carbon emitters through the felling and milling of trees. Because, and, you know, they burn a lot of slash, they burn a lot of sawdust in the milling, and also there's, I mean, there's just so much waste associated with logging that all of that carbon that was stored in the tree gets released very rapidly into the atmosphere. You know, and sometimes people talk about, well, wood products hold carbon for a long time. And that's true. Mm -hmm. But to get from a tree to that wood product, you also lose a lot of the carbon in the tree, right? So we have this industry that is a large carbon emitter, which is not regulated as a carbon emitter at all. Oh. Not like transportation or energy. It doesn't go into the state's carbon accounting. It does not? At all. Nope. Huh. And um, even this past year, I don't know if you followed it, but Oregon was going to vote on a cap and trade bill that didn't even include forests because wow. they didn't want to make it politically, you know, they didn't want to kill it politically. But even even though it didn't include forests, the Timber Unity folks circled up their log trucks and um, surrounded the Capitol with log trucks protesting cap and trade. And then the Republican senators all walked out and refused to allow the vote to be had. And they couldn't have the vote because they fled the state. Wow. They, they went to Idaho. Uh-huh. They literally like, <laughs> fled to prevent the vote on the cap and trade bill. Wow. So you can't really, it's pretty hard to legislate carbon, and it's really, really hard to talk about forests and carbon in, in our state government. Uh-huh. So that's the, that's the polluting side, though, right? So that's the problem. Right. But there's the exciting part that, you know, forests are also this huge part of climate mitigation um, because they're really, really good at sucking atmospheric carbon out of the air. Like, they're great at it. <laughs> it's what they do. Uh-huh. And if we could shift management of forests to focus on promoting that sequestration and storage, we could almost double the amount of carbon that's stored in the forest in the next 50 years. Oh, wow. There's all this really exciting scientific research coming out of OSU right now that's pointing to that. Like, 
as something that will, because we need to reduce atmospheric carbon, right? Right. We're like way over 350 parts per million. Yeah, way. It's like, wasn't it like 410 or something? I think it hit 415 this year. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So it's, it's not just about stopping emissions, like that's important, but we need to draw down existing atmospheric carbon. Yeah, definitely. And trees are so good at doing that. And if they could be managed for that value, rather than like the the value for a particular like private logging company, there'd be so much more public value. And there's all these like co benefits, like all this awesome you know water production and wildlife habitat, and you know just really really great things in these forests. All they're doing is hanging out, sequestering carbon, and then. You know, all the life that depends on them thrives. Right, right. So so this is really an angle that we'd want to see the Forest Service start to take more. Yes. <laughs> but again, it, it needs that, that direction from above. Remember those timber targets that I talked uh-huh, about? Right. What if those changed to being like carbon storage targets? Right, right. Yeah. Because they've they've shown that they're pretty good at meeting their timber targets. <laughs> exactly. Like when 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 they're given that direction, and I know there's I mean there's people in the agency honestly who would love to be doing this, mm-hmm. but they are you know really hamstrung by both the culture and the policies that they have to work with. Right. But we're hopeful with this you know with this incoming administration gives a lot of lip service to climate change. If we can connect it to forest management, that would be fantastic. Right. 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 Well, but it's not what a lot of people think about currently around forests is this like amazing ally in carbon drawdown. Right. Right. And so so preserving the forests that are there and then additionally uh replanting as well. Replanting and allowing existing trees to stay. Right. Grow bigger. You know. Right. So there's like reforestation and then the proforestation, which is basically just like don't keep cutting it down. Right. <laughs> let, let the existing trees grow bigger and sequester and store more carbon. Right, right. Yeah, so the in, the incoming administration, obviously it's too early to know who they're going to have in and all their positions and all that. And, and it seems like we've had, uh, well, we've had something encouraging with the suggestion, with the um, nomination for interior of representative yes. holland from new mexico which i was frankly shocked by that i'm like wait a minute is he actually going to do something that's just good because it kind of looks like it yeah isn't that awesome yeah <laughs> that one was really really exciting yeah yeah because you know a native american woman in charge of the department that has the bureau of indian affairs and it is yeah. t- extremely significant yeah yeah. So so that would be she'd she'd also be um obviously dealing with the Bureau of Land Management lands, you know, which we had mentioned, mm-hmm. you know, earlier before. And then unfortunately the person he's talking about for the Ag Secretary, which would be Ooh. Forest Services, is uh Vilsack. I I, I think Who already right. was Ag Secretary under Obama and was not great. No, 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 not 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 great for just regular agriculture either with his support of uh GMOs and, and uh well I mean, you know, they called them the 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 secretary from Monsanto, right? So that kind of tells you where he's at. So yes. we'll see though. There's a lot of a bunch you know, Biden just announced five more climate advisors today and okay. I haven't looked into who they are. Uh-huh. I, I honestly doubt any of them are looking at natural land solutions to climate because it's just no, it hasn't been a big part of the discussions. People have been so focused on emissions and energy right. and transportation. Right. And um, there's a whole new kind of the phrase is natural and working lands. But, you know, agriculture is also a huge uh, carbon, you know, emitter, which could be a carbon sink. Like right. the way we manage land, if we could build the soil's capacity to store carbon, mm-hmm. You know, and and manage it rather than tilling and releasing all of that Definitely. all the time. Mm-hmm. Like there are ways, if we made major shifts around land management, we could change things. Like you can't really change a car. I mean, a car is always going to be a car. It's going to have some. It's never going to become a carbon sink, right? Your car is right. always going to have some kind of emissions. It might be gas emissions, or it might be emissions from the energy that's generated to generate your electric car. Right. Which somehow people don't tend to talk about much. Right. Right. <laughs> right. All all energy generation has some kind of problem, right? It does. Mm-hmm. 
But you could actually change your agricultural practice or your forest management practice to go from carbon emissions to carbon sink. Right. Like, to me, that's really exciting and just not quite yet getting the attention it deserves. It's starting to. The conversations are starting. Like, this year in, in the Northwest, we started the uh, Northwest Forest Climate Alliance, uh-huh. which has about 50 different groups from forest conservation groups and climate advocacy groups that are all sharing information and helping each other on campaigns. Right. And that kind of cross-pollination is happening more and more and is, is exciting. But there's so much more that could be done. Um, and across the country, all, you know, all land management groups, if they start thinking primarily about how do we manage this land to increase its carbon storage. Um, right. Right. We need to. Like, it can't, yeah, like no. I said, it can't be timber sale by timber sale anymore. Yeah. <laughs> like the, the issues are just so much bigger than they were when we started in the 90s. Yeah, no, absolutely. No, a lot a lot has changed. And and one other, and, and we've been on the phone for almost an hour now, so I, I want to let you go here pretty soon. But but one thing also that uh, people are talking about a lot more now than they were, you know, say back in the year 2000, is uh, ideas of climate justice. And so I was just mm-hmm. wondering what your thoughts are. Yeah. Well, this this came up a lot when we were talking about the fires, mm-hmm. you know, this this year, because the people who are most impacted by the fires tend to be the people who ha- are the least resourced. Right. We saw this in the communities in southern Oregon. You know, it was the, it was the trailer parks that burned down. Right. right. Um, and in communities like Gates and Mill City in, you know, rural wooded valleys in the Cascades, those are not people with a lot of a lot of resources. Right. And so and, and or insurance or a backup place to live, mm-hmm. um, or the money to have done all of like the home hardening that we've talked about. Yeah, the, the new roof. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So I think any policies going forward need to specifically focus on that economic justice part of, like, you know, we could call them the climate change impacts, mm-hmm. um, or impacts of any natural disaster. It always falls hardest on the people who don't have a safety net. Right. So I think there is one, like, very clear intersection Mm-hmm. That and and there is there is a federal policy that is like just amazing. There's a federal bill called the Wildfire Defense Act that Senator Kamala Harris brought forward that I hope keeps moving mm-hmm. once she moves to becoming vice president. That really looks at that um, economic justice element of fire okay. and helping people um, who are the most vulnerable and the most impacted. So that's one aspect. Um, and another aspect of just land justice that we've been thinking about at Bark more and more is mm-hmm. what does it look like for uh, conservation groups and land groups to get involved in the land back movement? Right. Mm-hmm. Um, like I said, you know, all of all of the national forests are stolen land, mm-hmm. and many are like in Oregon are specifically stolen land. Like the Klamath tribe was terminated. And there in the 50s, and their land, their reservation became the Fremont Wyoming National Forest. Oh, wow. I did not know that. Yeah. And, you know, it's things like that are that clear, you know? And so it's recent. Very recent. Mm-hmm. My, my work colleague and I are actually putting together a, a webinar specifically about national forests on stolen lands to happen oh, wow. in February, where we talk about uh, violations of treaties, tribal termination, um, you know, the land, the termination of native title, the removal of people and how all of those threads went into creating national forests. Right. And how they still impact tribal people in Oregon right now. Wow. And this is, you know, this is controversial in conservation groups. Mm Mm-hmm. Other other groups do not like what we're doing. <laughs> well, and, you know, the the conservationists have, have in some cases been slow to pick up on that. And one and you know, and if you go back far enough, of course there were conservationists who actually were anti indigenous, you know? Oh yeah. You know, they, either, I mean, very strongly. Yeah, yeah. Either personally or, you know, or, or in the in the ideas that they were putting forth. And and as you uh, sort of implied earlier in the conversation, the idea of wilderness can itself be a form of indigenous erasure. Mm-hmm. Exactly. I mean, people like John Muir, you know, wanted the Native people out of Yosemite. The National mm-hmm. Park Service created Yellowstone by excluding the indigenous people who had been using it for tens of thousands of years. Right. You know, this idea, this conservation ethic was very much 
uh, ha- had that sense that still is in, like, it's embedded in the Wilderness Act, right? It says, wilderness is a place where man is a visitor but does not stay. Yeah. And that is at a completely European colonial idea of land. Yeah. And it's just wrong. Like, that's just not how, how it ever was. Yeah. You know? Yeah. No. And the, the human imprint on this area is vast. Mm-hmm. And they just didn't manage it in, you know, a way that was visible to Europeans. They just didn't see it because they were really good at only seeing what they wanted to see. Yeah. So, yeah, we, we want to push back on that. And, and it does, it is raising some hackles in the more, I don't know, traditional or the bigger environmental groups who don't mm-hmm. like the idea of, as they would call it, losing control. Mm -hmm. of the land, because even though it's managed by the federal government, they feel like they have a voice in the federal government. Maybe that's a mythology, or maybe that's an aspect of their privilege. Um, But we're we're starting to raise that question about what what it would look like. So that's that's one thing that we're doing. And um, just just continually looking to find where the where the intersections between environmental justice and land conservation are. And right. if they're not there, like how to change our work to make make sure that they are there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it's it's been really encouraging the last few years to see all these subjects, you know, come up and see the these different movements really become uh, more nuanced and more inclusive in some really important ways. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we've got a lot of work still to do. Oh yeah, but <laughs> but the conversations are starting, and the um, how to say the, the humility uh-huh. and is growing and people are really actually starting to ask whether what we thought was right was really right and and realizing that it wasn't and like we've been kind of wrong-headed for you know many years and the whole history of the conservation movement has been really rooted in that kind of white supremacist and colonial way and it, it's hard at somebody who's like this has been my movement for the past 25 years mm-hmm. You're like all right well there's time to change right yeah yeah (laughs) let's do this team because we just cannot keep going in that that same direction yeah yeah no i I definitely i definitely agree yeah and it's 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 uh the opportunity for growth is uh, exciting i think actually yeah i think so too some people i think they, they feel scared but you know hopefully they can get over it because it is i mean everything has to change the way that things have been going is not right yeah and I think we're, you know, everyone was like, I'm so ready for 2020 to be over and then it's going to be done. I was like, are you kidding? <laughs> like, <laughs> I know, right? Things are just going to get harder. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and um, we need to be able to be resilient and adaptive uh-huh. um, to that. And that means really, yeah, learning the mistakes of our own pasts and those of our like ancestors of movement and, um, and changing them. Right. What well, and and looking to other people and other traditions, you know, outside of settler colonialism for you know direction and mm-hmm. or at least inspiration on what we should be doing. Right. Yeah, I'm going to attend a webinar on biocultural restoration next week that oh, I'm cool. super excited about, mm-hmm. which is all about how do you do restoration in a way that. Um, also enlivens the communities from a, a native lens. All the speakers are indigenous. Oh, I'm that's like, great. Yes. Yeah. Like that kind of thing is happening. And, um, and I invited all the people I know in conservation to go. I was like, please come. We'll see if they do. Uh-huh. But like, those are the stories and the voices that we need to hear to shift our own work. Yeah. Yeah. No, those, those subjects have really been especially intriguing to me the last couple of years. And I've been trying to bring those voices onto the, onto the podcast here as well, because it's just, yeah, it's, it's clear that Western civilization is kind of reaching a dead end at this point. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Very much. It's plummeting towards a dead end, you might even say. Yeah. Yeah. In so many ways. So yeah. Yeah. We have to do something else different at this point. We just have to. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. It's, it's like, it's, it's no longer this like act of like, you know, a lot of times people said, oh, conservation is something that we do because we're privileged. I'm like, right now it feels like Everything is about survival, right? You know, if, right? if we we do not change, and maybe not even my own, but mm-hmm. you know, like the the larger cultural survival, not not necessarily the Western culture. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm like I'm, just, I'm glad you made that point. Yeah, yeah. 
So yeah. it's fun times. It yeah. is it is really different than when I felt like I could just sit in like a tree and save that tree and was doing my part. Uh-huh. And it, in some ways it is because uh-huh. the, those experiences and the attention that that brings and the transformational process of being part of a movement mm-hmm. that saves a place is huge. Definitely. Mm-hmm. But it's it's also beyond like a tree now. Yeah. 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 I mean, the the experiences I had, you know, around the forest activism and going to the action camps and, you know, uh, and, and just the there was almost a trench in the trenches kind of feel to it, you know, and totally. there was a there was a camaraderie and, and that, that came out of that and some really close connections that I still have. You know, uh, I mean, to the state, I mean, you know, here I am calling you up after all this time, you know, because, <laughs> right. you know, but, and so, yeah, I definitely agree that the personal aspect of those kinds of battles is, is super important, you know, and, and can really help people. And I, you know, interviewed someone earlier this year who's, you know, they're like, you know, 20 something sitting in a tree and, in, in, in a, in a, you know, in a redwood down in Northern California. And it was great to see it still happening. And then it was great mm-hmm. to see this the, this younger generation making all sorts of different connections that we weren't making back then yet you know what i mean like yeah we know. were not an intersectional movement back then mm, no no and, and here she was sitting in the tree being like you know yeah and i and i feel totally in solidarity with my comrades who are on the streets out there you know trying trying to stop the cops you know and 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 that was really that was really encouraging to see that so i, I don't know i look around at the movements and i look around at the at the younger people especially and i i often feel encouraged uh, by where things are going, because I feel like their their analysis is really a lot uh, deeper than yeah. you know, and and that's a good thing. Oh yeah, I, my my daughter is sixteen now. Oh like, my god! <laughs> <laughs> but, okay, but, um, I feel old now. <laughs> right, but yeah, she like what what she is thinking of and the connections she is working on, like with her affinity group and like what they talk about. I'm like, oh my gosh. You're getting this leg up that, mm-hmm. I mean, I just never could have even imagined at that age. Mm-hmm. The the level of um, just engagement and thoughtfulness. I mean, and the teens also in grief, honestly, yeah. and anger. Yeah. They're like, you know, my son's 11, and he's more prone towards like, why are you leaving us with all this crap? Uh-huh. I'm like, Sorry, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, you know, it's hard for them because they know that they are, you know, I, I grew up not having the sense, like, of impending doom in my future. No, I didn't have it either. And, and they do. Mm-hmm. You know? And so, like, trying to, to be honest, like, yeah, actually, you're kind of fucked. As, yeah. as, as I'm also trying to give them all the tools that I know to help make them more resilient to it. It's, it is. It's fascinating and a little bit hopeful. But I also just feel sad for being young and knowing that. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's a real different place, and, I, and more and more, I, I I try to think of what is it that I can do to support you know those efforts. You know, how is it that mm-hmm. I can be an ally to the younger people? You know. Yeah, I know because they're really the ones who are going to be doing it. Like I, that positioning ourselves just as like good ancestors to the generation who's really going to change things. Right. That right. that helps my mind a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> be like, this is generational work. This it is. is. It's going to take a long, it took a long time to get here. And it's going to take a long time to get out. Right, right. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. <laughs> but, however, speaking of generational work, I've got a, my, my son is demanding my attention for about the past 20 minutes. Awesome. <laughs> so I okay. Have to shift out. Great. <laughs> <laughs> but, but so good to talk to you and talk about all this. Yeah, it was awesome, Brenna. And, um, I, you know, I hope to come back up to Oregon sometime this year. And, uh, if so, uh, I'd love to, to look you up. It'd be nice yeah, to, to we're catch still up. out on the farm. You oh, know that's where great. we are. Cool. All right. Thanks so much, Brenna. Okay. You take care, Khalid. Yeah. Bye bye. Okay. Bye. Voices for Nature and Peace is produced in the Gila River Valley, New Mexico, USA, on land that we acknowledge is illegally occupied Apache territory. The intro music is Zero G Yogi by Big Z, with narration by Kelly Moody of the Ground Shots podcast. This outro music is Trip A, also by Big Z. Commercial break narration by Nikki Hill. To become a financial supporter of this podcast and to gain access to members-only content, visit patreon.com slash colibri, K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. 
For more information on Radio Free Sunroot programming, please visit RadioFreeSunroot.com. Thank you for listening. May you find joy in your own nature and peace.